Namaste and in La Ketch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is Stefan Neff. He's from almost down under. He's from New Zealand, and he is anesthesiologist, no, anesthetist, let me get that right, an advocate for sobriety. We're going to have an interesting com conversation about that. A filmmaker, a podcast host and best-selling author of the book, My Steps to Sobriety, Living a Fantastic Life Without Alcohol. And he is the uh, podcast host for Steps to Sobriety. And probably another one that he mentioned earlier that uh, <laughs> I've, I've now forgotten. So, Stefan, glad to have you here, brother. It's an absolute honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for having me, Zen. Much, much appreciated. Well, it seems like, uh, you know, destiny kind of caught up with us, right? Um, <laughs> and from our previous conversation, right, there's too much uh, synchronicity here. <laughs> and which is perfect it is i mean that is the, the the privilege of choice and the privilege of living an intentional life that we actually think huh is there in is that really it and, and those of us who are willing are going out there and making connections and that is what we do here right we are opening up we are being vulnerable uh, but at the same token, actually show leadership by being honest and authentic. And I think that is the, the power of, that all of us have. Yeah, words don't um, matter. It's how do we lead by example? Uh, um, and, and you fit right, you know, you just launched right in. And this is about sharing what goes on inside that drives us to be examples. And my guests have all kinds of different experiences that lead them mm -hmm. to their inner awareness, whether it's a voice, a sense. Mm -hmm visions you know all kinds of things like that that we don't talk about openly <laughs> right so true so true and how well, that, often have go ahead no, those are, no the those of us those of us who do are are nowadays the leaders um we those used to be called crazy do. and put in institutions oh exactly yeah, yeah, right. Right. The, the, <laughs> the inmates are running the asylum now <laughs> Ah, that's true. That's true. Well, you know, life is a circus. It has no two ways around it. Now, most of us are running around like the bearded lady or something like that. Nowadays, I like myself to, to be a bit more the, the ringmaster. At least I take control of all the madness uh, in the circus. And to at least to a degree that I can. Uh, and it's quite amazing what you, what you have control over. Um, often enough, we find ourselves thrown around by events in our lives, uh, situations, settings in our lives that we take for granted and where we consider ourselves victims and powerless and helpless and hopeless. And we think oh, yeah, these are how, lies. How did yeah. you, you know, you obviously have gotten in touch with yourself. How did that begin and what kind of awakening process did you notice was it when you were young teenage mm. a little mm. older no. or was there a smattering of looking back now those mm. little breadcrumbs that were shared with you along the way like so many people um who adore the light and and appreciate the light for what it is a gift you have to know the darkness i sincerely do apologize i sincerely do apologize oh i couldn't hear anything oh that's good no, i do apologize uh, the phone just went off here um i switched it off sorry brother um i thought i had switched off And mine sometimes go off too. I just ignore it. Um, I was surprised that you didn't hear me. So that's cool. Um, so uh, I do apologize. So you need to cut there. Um, okay, I'll, I'll oh. start. I'll, I'll start. Dare. No, that, no, that, that's <laughs> fine. I'll, I'll just get this out. Um, and I can, I can make, I'm good enough right. that I can show I, up and get through it. I, I start again um, with, uh, to answer your question with regards to darkness and light. Yeah. I give it five seconds that you can cut. Okay. Uh, 
like so many people out there who nowadays appreciate the light for the gift that it is, uh, you have to know darkness. And that unfortunately is also true for me. I had I had a reasonable childhood, uh, maybe a little bit of abandonment simply because of divorce and mum having to work all the time and I was a latchkey child. So mm. maybe a bit more a loner, um, but that was about it. N nothing, nothing to write home about. But then when I was 13, I was in the wrong place, wrong time, and I became the victim of a gang assault. Um, so I got pretty smashed up and um it was the start of a very dark journey um i uh, it it came out of the blue and i basically went to the police and and got the guy arrested he ended up behind bars um and he threatened that he would kill me basically as soon as he is released so i had three years in order to get my shit together because in my mind i would have this rambo life yeah, exactly. So I started martial arts um, and very intensive. So, mm. and this was a time where that was the 70s, uh, early 80s. So bottom line is there was no appreciation of PTSD. There was no appreciation of, of the damage that was done to my me deep inside. Mm -hmm. um, and me turning from this maybe a little pudgy teenager into this, this, fighting machine into this lean body um that was quite a, a transformation and i i looked at it in a very positive way i reframed all the trauma into something hey here i'm the survivor i'm the man mm -hmm. um but it was also it was you get it through it heavy. physically maybe yeah. not so much so emotionally yet that yet you exactly compensation so mm -hmm. that it wouldn't happen again really. exactly Exactly. But I mean, bottom line is I was here, I was uh, working hard at school. Then I worked hard to earn some money. I didn't have much money. So I, I stacked shelves somewhere in, in, in a hardware store. Uh, and then I trained. So if you look back at it, you could actually say that I was a workaholic long before I became an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. um, so running, running away um, was, I think, always something that I was very good at. Um, I think a lot of people are, we don't necessarily, you know, we would avoid conflict at all costs. <laughs> we'll do anything, especially conflict inside. Yeah. Right. Which is where I That's... think you're going with that. The well, other takes care of yourself, right? As long as we carry that conflict yeah. though, we're yeah. always missing, you know, feeling yeah. disconnected, almost abandoned. And, yeah. and yet we do it to ourselves as much as anything. And I think with hindsight, it is so sad that I was never taught how to feel my emotions mm -hmm. and that it's okay to have emotions, negative emotions. Um, I always, I don't know it, either if it was a core belief and when it was laid down, but uh, it, it, it was always, I was going for the yeah i'm the man the man um and that also meant you know conquering as many women as possible but then as soon as the honeymoon period was was finished two three months or even less sometimes and things became less of a conquer but rather now that's normal life oh i was out of there mm -hmm. um so again i was i was running away from um, of a seeking pleasure and running away from pain. So this kind of theme is clearly appearing there. Alcohol was actually not, not a part of it until I really hit university. Um, and in there, um, I realized, A, that this the, the ringleader will never find me. It was the time before in the internet, I was in a different town. Uh, I knew I was actually safe. B, I, rec I found women. And C, I found alcohol. Uh -oh. And alcohol suddenly gave me that freedom, oh, gave me a glimmer of the light. The pain was no longer there. I mean, they had beaten, they, they knocked out my teeth. So I had uh, temporary crowns and it looked like shit. And so for five years, I, I didn't laugh. And then the first time that the alcohol, the dopamine rush hit me, my God, there was this belly laughter coming out of me. And I didn't recognize who was, who made that noise. Mm. It was me. 
and it was beautiful. And I still get goosebumps. Damn it, I get goosebumps <laughs> just re remembering that. Right. And that's a oh, powerful, that's too. Right? Absolutely, that's a powerful shift. Absolutely, and but it 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 shows the the power of that memory that was laid down. And then thereafter, I was always searching for that. And you never get right, that. You open up that the, I think a lot of this, maybe even use drugs that way, right? There's that initial letting go, you, you lose your mind, so to speak. And, and then you find yourself in that moment of freedom because mm. you're detached from the rest of, of your angst and turmoil and trauma or whatever it is. Exactly, exactly. And then, and, and what it is, is just the release of your thought patterns for a moment. And then you try to seek that again because you think it was the alcohol or the drug that mm. allowed you to let go of it. And no, that wasn't. It was a moment of some, experiencing an unknown new sensation mm. and feeling the freedom in it. Exactly. Exactly right. And it, the freedom is a beautiful word. There was exactly, or, or light, or however you call it, mm -hmm. there was this new experience where suddenly the pain was gone. And I think that is such a powerful thing because I had not learned any other techniques than running away. And now this new thing, either sex, sex addiction, maybe whatever's mm -hmm. playing a bit there, alcohol, a lot of things which give you I this, can't imagine oh, yes. being attracted to girls in college. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. you're supposed to be studying. <laughs> no, the reality was uh, this was the eighties. Um, the cameras there were no cameras on cell phones. Okay, oh, not even cell phones. Fuck it. So basically, it was a world with a lot of freedom, um, where. Uh, women were just as much experimenting with their sexuality as men. Um, yeah. So Especially this at was... that age, you got no boundaries. You you don't know where they are. You're still you're just exploring them, and there's no exactly unless so you this... have a very strict moral background. Or, no. yeah. you know. Yeah. But these were these were beautiful times. This was a time of freedom. This was a time of of oh, just amazing times. I had a great time. Um, but as with everything. Um, it was basically sugarcoating my life artificially um, with all those escapes. And I never learned how to deal with the not so great times. Hmm. And and funnily enough, life has got a way of humbling you. So a lot yeah, of shit storms. Rip the band off. Oh, please. Um, no, I had a lot of uh, shit storms waiting for me um, in the in the near future. And... The only thing I, I knew what to do was run away and so work harder in this case. Um, and when I'm not, I couldn't work anymore because it's just it's 16 hours and my, my brain was foggy. Okay, give me a drink. So it was that work hard, play hard attitude that was very much encouraged in the 80s, in the 90s. That is how a self-made man is, you know. You sure, because there were shit. certain protocols and processes and, and things that you just could do brainless or not right you could yep. you know there were functional alcoholics functional drug addicts that <laughs> exactly knew how to do the things that they did sometimes extremely well exactly and yet exactly it was exactly. supported by and, arts and so trauma in my life came in layers and healing ultimately came in layers as well but uh, it is i just i just played the the play hard far too long far too hard i drank um a lot of alcohol uh which didn't even touch the sides anymore so there was tolerance but more importantly there was no more happiness there was mm -hmm. no more freedom no more light it was just numbing i think that's the best i could hope for at that time and it was just, it was, it was a, uh, a dangerous time, a really dangerous time in my life. And, and my family helped me by organizing a, a rehab stint. And that was the hardest thing I've ever done. You had a strong family around you. Mm. Yes, yes. And for that, I must be internally uh, forever grateful to my wife, uh, now ex-wife. But uh, she, she was there for me. Um, she was equally an alcoholic. She equally had her, her drama um, and was 
I guess, a broken woman as well. Uh, but she had found Jesus Christ three, four years uh, before I went into rehab. She got straight into, uh, into well, white knuckling, not drinking. Um, so she did it this way with the help of her church. For me, I was never touched that way. So that didn't mean a thing. Um, but I ended up uh, in a very good, a very good rehab program. Um, the, everyone there was an addict, bar one or two of the doctors. Everyone else, from the yoga teacher to the case managers to the, you name it, they were all addicts. Down they, the path. Exactly. You can't bullshit a bullshitter. Well, yeah, um, and this so is they the, knew the it. things that we don't really pay attention to today yep. in understanding where others are we assume so much about people without inquiring is <laughs> okay you know who are you what do you go through how can i get to know you and, and understand your perspective so that i hear your words more clearly absolutely yeah yeah true um it is there's an i think it's an asian uh proverb that says every time an elderly person dies a library is burned down there's so many, there's so much knowledge, so much experience, so much life skills that are getting lost. Um, and especially with us no longer talking openly, honestly, with us having this kind of uh, fake facade um, of social media, of, you know, looking perfect all the time, all that bullshit. Right. It's just perfect, we, the six figure income, the, uh, the four hour weeks, and all that kind of stuff. And where is the core? You, well, that's right. That's right. What is what is your why? What is your what is your your drive? Where does where does really yeah. who are you? More importantly, are you a star who, traveler or a Ferengi? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who do you want to be? More importantly, who do you want to be when you grow up? And I could only tell you what I was. When they asked me, Stefan, who are you? Well, I, I'm an anesthetist. I'm a pain physician. Hey, no, no, no. Who are you? We self-identify that way for a number of years. Now, do you think that's by decade or, or by cycles of maturation? You know, because we get locked into a profession for a while. We are that profession, mm. right? Mm, absolutely. What we do, right? Um, and it's part of the maturation process because I don't yeah. think, yeah. I, I don't know, um, maybe I do. When we have those changes, for instance, there was a dear friend of mine, uh, mixed blood Cherokee, that told me in my mid 40s that, you know, in our tradition that you cannot join or form your own council until you're 51. <laughs> good <laughs> right now, isn't that telling uh, okay so what happens when you're 51 well you're usually uh, a grandparent by that time yeah you're far advanced in your profession or your way of yeah. life to to where you yeah. really are an expert of whatever you do yeah um, and, and there's all kinds of other ancillary things that go along with that as well so that it's just like wow that makes so much sense why don't we yeah. talk about that very true very true um what you're saying here however is the end result of a lot of introspection of a lot of reflection um and most of us don't do that i see it again and again as an anesthetist um i'm i'm working now well, we have curiosity other. as kids but you yeah. know no. as an anesthetist that you you see no, no. I, as an anesthetist, I, I see patients every day, and it's typically a middle-aged man or, you know, something has happened. They are working hard, they are 50, and suddenly their shoulder is stuffed because of an accident. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time that they stop, think, and feel. Because for the last 30 years or 50, 40 years, they were flat out. They have never stopped to feel. And now suddenly they're terrified because they are suddenly thinking, oh, my God, will I be able to continue as a truck driver or in the logging industry or whatever it is? Right. Um, and so suddenly they, they hit that wall and think, oh, shit. And it is I often say to these people that it is actually a, a privilege, 
a, a gift that was given to you, your injury, because you, you are now stopping, you are now feeling, you have actually time to reflect and can, can think, is, am I on the right path? Do you um, think that there's a, a speaking of the inner inquiry, right? Um, do you think that there is a motivation for the universe to supply that experience because of an unspoken, unfulfilled expectation <laughs> of <laughs> finding something, right? Or, or there's something <laughs> missing? <laughs> we just had in a preamble we discussed that so uh -huh. therefore i have to laugh here um yes yes i believe so i believe that that there is a lot of energy out there that we can harness that is part of us and that is waiting to come out but we keep ourselves so busy and we distract ourselves with so many short-term uh, pleasures, let that be the alcohol, let it be the sugar, the sex, the gambling, the social media. Um, All the distractions away from fulfilling self in ways that are, or that make sense, rather than satiate the senses. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And I think that is, that is the key that you learn when suddenly the universe hits you over the head with a two by four and say mm -hmm. for crying out loud we sent you so many messages you didn't listen so here you go bang right. okay wake up wake up and that is beautiful and that happened to me about ah oh, 10 years now ago when i went into rehab and because it it made me stop the reliance on alcohol and the reliance on escaping uh, yeah. my reality it taught me how to stop it taught me how to feel and it started me on a journey of healing and i think that is the beautiful thing because this journey of healing equals a journey of growth equals a journey of exploration of uh, new insights and i have always throughout my life i i was a, a a keen student and every day where i would not learn something new was a sad day so i made sure i'm learning now mm -hmm. you could say that kept me busy you could say that was escapism uh maybe well, um, curiosity also, I, I don't think it is going that direction yet um the pattern and, and you kind of I hear this story quite a bit or, or this kind of pattern in experience, right? Do you, do you have a sense that this kind of pattern learning curve, if you will, yeah. um, has a particular rhythm and cycle and, and appearance and disappearance and forewarning yeah. and post warning and, yeah. you know, all of those kinds of things. And I also wonder, and this is going a little different direction in reference to forces, if you will, uh, referencing the Kabbalah, right? The, the 72 names of God, 36 lesser, 36 greater is what they call them. Uh, and it always seemed to me the one gave the memo. The others tested you to see if you got it. <laughs> Good point. Both uh, leading you to the one inside you. <laughs> Uh, good point. Good point. Uh, often we have to learn the uh, the same lesson five or six times just to make sure that, <laughs> that we're really learning it. Okay, there's this point. Uh, sometimes uh, I, I, I don't see it necessarily as uh, the way you framed it. I see the, the path of healing and of growth more as a very meandering and convoluted path. You can't see around the corners. You see just a little bit. I will not disagree with that whatsoever. <laughs> exactly. However, so, from an observation, from an observer yeah. with, you know, multiple perspectives of this same kind of process, yeah, the the way the process takes place is always different. It's still the same process, though. Oh, touche, touche, exactly. There's if you That's if you the want to call it of the one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the, the enlightenment, although this word is meanwhile so uh, uh, misused. Yeah, the um, but the, the yeah, superior man. Yeah, you know, becoming who you were meant to be, mm -hmm. um, that journey um, 
is beautiful, but it is not an easy journey. It has so many trials and tribulations. It's no longer funny. I mean, Frodo, right. move your ring aside here. This is my my journey is far more interesting than Lord of the Rings and everything right. else combined. It's like, you know, Campbell talking about the hero's journey. The, you're the hero. You are. And unfortunately, in order to be the hero, you have to have the Dark Knight of the Soul. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to go for all these trials and tribulations. And we... We often don't see those things or those events as the gifts that they are. Uh, they are bitches when it happens. Uh, right now I'm going through uh, a divorce. I'm going through uh, not a nice relationship with one of my sons. Um, there, there are certain things that are, uh, that really hurt me. Okay, that are really there and shaking my 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 core foundation. But I know also that this is a time of of immense growth, of me being tested, of me, of the, the pressure, creating a diamond, a uh, very rough diamond in this case. Um, I'll take that, but um, it is, it's still there. It is, whilst I'm, whilst part of me is struggling, the other part of me is looking forward to, to the lessons that I will learn from it. And who this new person of it. who this new person is who yeah. will come out after the dust has settled now can and we that, think that, that, that and expand on that just a little bit i i like to take things uh, out there right hmm. and uh, as you've noticed already what about so we're individuals in a collective hmm. with similar behavior patterns ubiquitously and on a global scale uh, in the personality of the civilization, right? Can we see it as such? It appears very similar to the personal experience that most of us go through. And because we're a little reluctant to go through that, the world is in the shape that it's in presently. <laughs> does that kind of, of view resonate and if so then based on what we know and, and what you know of the process and its convolutedness and where it might take us and, and hmm. eventually leading us to the triumph over whatever challenge we're facing how do you see that kind of activity permeating the humanity now as we move post COVID in a new normal that most of us don't know what the hell's going on. And we're just trying to find something together that makes sense. That is exactly what is occurring right now here between the two of us up until an hour and a bit ago, we had no clue about each other. Hmm. And we start, suddenly started communicating because we thought, okay, this guy sounds quite interesting. And you thought, okay, he might be good on my show. And suddenly we've got this connection, something that would have never occurred in the past. But because we are on this path of changing ourselves, we are willing to open up. We are willing to be authentic and show integrity. Um, therefore, we are better communicators. And by us being open with each other, we are opening up doors. Now, in this case, just simple communication between the two of us. But since this show will reach others. And an instant resonance with, because of that willingness to be curious about each other, too. Exactly. But and so I believe that by us being on this journey of becoming better humans ourselves, we will have a, a flow on effect, uh, literally, the hopefully the, the, the snowball that turns into an avalanche. Um, because with us being out there with the two of us having our shows, we are we are putting ourselves out there. And we are hopefully changing minds. We are planting we a little better seeds. metaphor for here in Arizona, snowball yeah. wouldn't last. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> <fair call. laughs> I'll give you that. There, there it is, the snowball chance in hell, right? Um, <laughs> but it, you know what I mean. It is basically here. how can we how can we plant seeds into yeah. the minds of others so that others stop for a bit, yeah. feel, think, and maybe make a different choice. <laughs> give you an example. Um 
there was a beautiful study out of, I believe, Finland, some Scandinavian country, um, where they changed the food in the prison system. Um, and just within a few days of actually having healthy, nourishing food, their violence rate went down 30%. Mm. So by us stopping thinking, feeling, implementing a small change, we can change society. We can change what is happening around us. By you sitting down with an angry young man and actually just listening to his story, you might prevent him going home and beating the shit out of his young wife and his baby tonight, you know? So by us making small steps, putting that little smile onto the, the checkout lady's face, um, you will have made her day. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you're making a phone call out of the blue to someone might actually literally save his life mm -hmm. um, because he was so depressed and so socially withdrawn that he had enough. All these things by us do, being on this hero's journey, this is not a journey for us alone because we, with our efforts, we, we have this aura, this kind of energy field around us that touches others. Mm -hmm. And it is said with, with addiction that the, uh, an addict's life touches about 28 people. Um, and I don't know where that study comes from, uh, but it is the same when we now look at each other as, as bringers of light, of, of, of positive energy. We equally can affect 28 people. Now, if, if I do 28 and you do 28 and then we do a show and maybe times that times 100, well, are we not making a difference? Are we not making the world a better place? Absolutely. I certainly hope so. Yeah. And by being present, it even magnifies that. The reason I say this, and, and this was a, uh, some instruction I got, the demonstration of how to determine the size of your aura. Right. And the woman who did the, the workshop was trained in the Huna way, which is Hawaiian shamanism. And she used two dowsing rods. She had me, uh, and I, I showed up early. There was a 40 foot square room that she was going to be giving her workshop in. And of course, I show up early to ask questions and, and do all that kind of magic stuff. Right. Uh, and so she said, well, here, let me show you. And, and so she stuck me in a corner, not facing it. Right. <laughs> she says, I want you to go in the past and in the future and then in the present. And I will start from the other corner, clear the rods, come to you in each of those places and where you where I encounter the rods encounter your aura and open, I'll stop, we'll mark the spot and you'll open your eyes and look at it and then we'll take a look at the comparison. Yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. So did the past, did the future. Um, she went through a routine and she picks up a rock from the windowsill that's right next to me, puts it in my hand. She says, now focus on this. So I did. She does her thing. Barely got two steps in from across the room. The past and the future both opened up about six feet away. So that was six feet compared to a 40 foot hypotenuse. So that was about 50 feet. Yeah. And that was without trying. Mm. So imagine if we mm. were to be in that space and, and, or not be in that space as the case may be. <laughs> Well, right. touche, touche, exactly. Yeah, just be yeah. empty and present yeah. and curious of what is here that I can participate in to the best of my ability. Yep. Wow. It just opens all kinds of doors. And, and it may be so simple as to walk into the store and see somebody that needs help and offering it. Touche, touche. Very nice. But, but, it, it, this, uh, but these are all... These are all examples of very intentional living. Absolutely. Being here right now in it's the discipline. moment. Discipline. Isn't it? Yeah. But it's discipline is maybe ne a negative word. Um, it's if we say, call oh, it a habit or 
Uh, no, okay. I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to disarm already arguments of someone says, oh, discipline. Uh, for them, it might have a negative connotation. I think it is something well, that would it be like train. they were a disciple. Ooh, ooh, nice one. Nice one. I think when discipline comes. I think if we train ourselves to become more intentional beings and enjoy the here and now and realize that the past has gone and we can't do anything about it apart from learning from it uh, and the future hasn't even arrived yet but we can do so much right now right here and that is our power and i think too many people don't don't realize that they have this power and therefore they they forever swim in that pity party of victim reality um, is we all have it we have Every but you need one of us yeah. but you need to be taught how to use that power you need to be taught that you have the power um so it's like harry potter he didn't know that he was a wizard um but you know sooner or later uh you know, uh, I, knew he, I, knew. He got... I, I discovered it uh -huh. because my own the, i started early right i was orphaned and adopted and then having the questions early I found out I was adopted at four and a half and they brought my sister home. Really cute little baby. I got a nice picture of me kissing her <laughs> and the first day she was there, right? Wrapped in a blanket. And my parents decided it was time to tell me I was adopted. And so after they did, I didn't have any angst over it. Didn't, you know, I wondered who my biologicals were. I had unconditional love from them and knew that. So that was not a question. I didn't feel abandoned in any way. And yet... I was left with a question because it had some Sunday school already. My question was, do I have a father and uh, no, if I have a father and mother in heaven, can I talk to them? Ha, 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 ha. I was four and a half. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guess what happened? A few weeks, maybe a month or so later, I'm, um, we, we have a two-story house and i'm standing on the landing looking out my elbows in the windowsill looking out over the front porch chin on my hands and it's at night porch lights on i'm watching cars go by waiting for dad to come back with ice cream from the store i think and all of a sudden i hear this voice booming male powerful hey you and I didn't try to interact with it. It didn't scare me. It startled me, though, enough to where I spun around and I immediately asked my mother, who was sitting down at the bottom stairs watching television, if she could hear the voice. She says, what voice? <laughs> that voice says, hey, you, right? Imagine a four-and-a-half-year-old trying to talk mm. deep. Not happening. Uh, <laughs> and she just warded it off. She says, but I didn't hear any voice. must have been a peeping Tom. At four and a half, I knew better than deny what my experience was. So I would spend nights after that in front of a window at night, sending that voice out, waiting for it to come back. And it wasn't until I shut up, right? Because you know how we, even in meditation, you got all these rampant thoughts going on. So you can't hear you. You're watching yourself think, but you're not hearing yourself. Yeah. That true place so i finally learned to just shut my mind off i toss it out you know and then have all these kinds of thoughts about it returning and and my yeah. desire for it right well i got quiet one night and i heard it and so i began to develop a way to communicate with that and it was a question and answer you know it was like hmm. better in jeopardy <laughs> <laughs> and I, I grew up with that and as I came to know it and had the experience and got curious more about it even asking you know in college whether you know I was willing to die to know truth right it led me to that and then showed up afterwards asking me if I was willing to die for what I believed in so you know when you have those kinds of things it's a different experience than most have and like you mm. said earlier, right, during that period yeah. of time, everybody just kind of thought you were nuts. Well, uh, I tried to talk to my parents about it, and they had me see a shrink, and, and he says after the third visit, you know, it was a good, it was a godsend. 
because he said uh, after the third visit that, you know, you're not crazy. You've had a spiritual awakening. <laughs> uh, why so young? You've got, you know, all the signs. Why so young? Not sure. Most people don't go through it. Don't go through it till their mid forties. If they oh, exactly. ever do. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And he said, so come here. I want to show you something. And so he takes me upstairs, opens up the door, my heart explodes, and there's a deck of tarot cards on a card table just inside the door. Now, this is a psychiatrist in the mid-70s <laughs> in, in rural America. <laughs> okay, Could what were the chances? Happened. I know. What right? were the ch chances? <laughs> so randomness brought this. Yeah, it wasn't random, uh, of course. He read my cards, had everything there that I hadn't even told him about. He says, you know, my best advice to you is keep your mouth shut. Adults aren't going to understand you. And so the following year, I hadn't kept my mouth shut, and my parents institutionalized me. Oh, and uh, I got beat up at frat house one night, so it was kind of appropriate. Um, they were afraid for me. I'm still in a pre-med program mm -hmm. in college, and they, because of my experience, they were concerned for my health. And so they got a chance to give me a rest and they did. And it wasn't that horrific an experience, even being on uh, 2000 micrograms of Thorazine a day. Should have been a lump in the corner, but I was up playing ping pong, beating the male nurses. So that didn't work. Uh, um, and eventually I realized the doc when the, you know, I told him what he wanted to hear instead of trying to talk to him about what I needed to talk to him about. And all of a sudden, miracle cure. I'd been diagnosed with the DSM-4. Um, you're probably familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually got out and was so scared of being honest and getting put back in that I would literally tremble on the inside and uh, so bad that my, that my body would physically tremble. And man, that was horrific for a couple of years until I got over it. And I got over it because it wasn't me. I think it's really, really difficult, isn't it? Uh, it is nowadays, there's a different appreciation of, of energy flows, of, of, of the fact that there is more out there than our modern science in 2024 can explain or can even imagine well we're um, getting it, closer isn't it i think there's a bit more a readiness to accept that there are things out there and i always i always sort of say if people are very skeptical i say look if if your grandma uh if we could go back to your grandma's time and tell her one day you know we get food we're going to put it into a box and then there's a little button that we press and it goes and two minutes later you have got a hot meal she would look at you and think are you nuts boy yeah what are um, you dick tracy or, right. well exactly or what about what about we have got this this kind of funny funny thing looks like a like a like chocolate isn't it like a block of chocolate and you talk into it and you can get you can watch films in it do you think a grandma would have institutionalized you hell yes so that was then Nowadays, we accept that completely as normal. Mm -hmm. um, could it could it not be that indeed in 10 years or 20 years time, we have made further growth, a further, we have seen more enlightenment, we have seen more, maybe new technologies that well, We've been talking to... about it for some time, and, and this is what kind of troubles me. We've been talking about this for decades. What's the action of love? Because that's where we go to. Right, is that place of loving and being loved? And how do we portray that collectively as well as individually in listening to each other, being willing to be curious about each other to find the depths of experience? Because yeah. we hear certain words, we interpret interpret with our dictionary, not theirs. <laughs> True. Right. And so when we ought to be inquiring about their dictionary so that we can understand them, we're oh. forcing our dictionary on them, <laughs> misunderstanding their words <laughs> and reflecting oh. from that place of incongruence 
rather than asking them what they need, and you know, it's practice of active listening is what that particular process is called in most places now, where you're inquiring about, okay, this yeah. is what I heard you say, um, is that what you intended? Right, and, and those kinds of things. And yet there's more knee-jerk reaction to this presumption of what they meant and a willingness to feel aggressed upon first. Uh, it, I love that, it. Is that similar to what your experience is? Absolutely. I've known it. It's uh, we are. I think we are on the cusp of of accepting a far wider reality, and therefore maybe just maybe there's still hope for human mankind or mm -hmm. humankind or whatever we call it um for us as human beings right. to actually yeah, there's um, no ego without we go right <laughs> well uh and i'm sure we we humans can still put it in there um sure. okay. <laughs> <I'm good at laughs> absolutely so and i think that's that's the 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 constant battle um that is happening within us. Um, there will always be temptations. There will always be uh, times that we don't want to listen, that we actually just want to escape our reality, that we want to have that quick fix. Uh, and that's okay. There's this, you can't be perfect all the time for crying out loud. But no, you're you can just delaying your own happiness. Uh, touche. Uh, but you can you can make uh, the, the point of the five minute gardener. Um, if you have got, if you've got a garden and uh, every day from now on you will spend five minutes in your garden never less never more after a week you see a difference after a month your family will say well garden looks nice and after three months you've got bus tours coming along and looking at your garden <laughs> um, and that is with us making small changes but consistent changes and I think with that we can change ourselves so if, if I can change my garden into a masterpiece within a short period of time with the power of compound interest, imagine we do the same with our relationships. Imagine we do the same with our relationship with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't expect to have this massive enlightenment by just one sitting down somewhere on the top of a mountain in a lotus position and say, come on, download now. I'm ready for you. It right. doesn't work like that. Well, so, Orobindo, are you familiar with Sri Aurobindo? He, he's from right. closer to you than he was from, for me. Um, <laughs> Eastern Christian mystic from India. Um, if you're familiar with Nag Champa incense, it's made in Oroville, which is a place that was named after him. Uh, Sri Aurobindo would, one of his things was, in order to find your center, you've got to step into the middle of chaos <laughs> for many of us that's natural <laughs> and yeah, if there's no chaos we, we create it you know you either get so distracted and you lose yourself or you just be still for a moment and begin to look at everything and start recognizing patterns signs yeah. uh, symbols behaviors you know all kinds of things and yeah in so doing and in growing as a uh, on an awareness level it also oh. accentuates your skill set you'll actually oh. do better at what you do provided you love it and maybe even if mm. you don't mm. you'll have an increase in your capacity to do because you first learned how to be mm. and we get that equation backwards we think we got to do 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 in order to be and, and no, it's, it's, it comes first, right? we don't need to step in the doo-doo um, in in that though we apply our skill sets in greater ways and, and through those openings do you think that maybe there's an opportunity to further align with an intended purpose that we may have in our organic structure based on our genetic code and the frequency of the vibration of which we yeah. vibe at, right? The, that combination. What 
-hmm. because this is it seems that this is where science is leading us to yeah i 100 percent agree and it's and it, it leads us in in a funny old way because we are i mean 10 20 years ago no one would have thought much of the gut microbiome uh, this is just shit that you're shitting out uh okay. nowadays we recognize um the power of this all these beautiful uh, 100 trillion organisms that live within us and that are part of us so here we are accepting these things on an absolute micro level and understanding more the complexity of it. I think the more we in, in, in medicine and science understand the complexity of this beautiful web of interactions that is the human body, the more we are then willing also to go out and go a bit wider and think about energy and energy levels and being interconnected, the more we hear about scientific experiments that that turn the head up uh, the, the world upside down um when it comes to previously so-called established uh knowledge and that's that's already i mean there's a beautiful saying 1956 the president of harvard university uh told the students guys what you teach here what i teach you today as the absolute golden truth here is in 50 percent in 10 years is no longer true or it has been disproven or false nowadays we probably don't measure that in 10 years we measure it in five years and three years um that is the reality but of with the what, Moore's law what we know even less than yeah. that <laughs> yeah my right. point so we constantly learn more and i think therefore there's an increased awareness of that of, of the fallibility of knowledge um, and therefore an increase in curiosity, uh, people being willing to go that step outside of, ah, oh, no, that's all known and this is all rubbish or weird or I think that wall is breaking down. And I think there are uh, some practitioners out there in alternative medicine, uh, healers that are coming more into mainstream um there are people who are working together in teams where you have maybe an energy healer a nutritionist a um a physiotherapist a, a, you name it um a whole power team where uh, st the previously sort of fringe slash alternative medicine things um are now becoming absolutely recognized well, and you're and in medicine you're in the thick of that there's an exactly and that's the that's a beautiful thing i mean here i mean what i've learned in, in university in, in the 1980s compared it now with me being an anesthetist uh, and now a functional medicine uh, specialist branching out into that my goodness the, the, this is day and night when you just compared in one in one uh, career span um how things are changing so i'm 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 incredibly privileged to see that um and maybe therefore also i have the duty to point that out to actually come onto a show uh, like yours and actually say guys this is what is changing wake up be ready to be part of this transformation from the automaton of the of the industrial age towards a more enlightened towards a more open being do you think that your job would be would be in jeopardy when people get better at managing their own pain Ooh, ooh, ouch no because they're still stupid they're still putting their hands yeah, into okay. chainsaws okay come on and every saturday afternoon when the sun is out if i get work don't you worry people will do stupid things in the shed and i will have work that is no problem okay. but having said that my job will be easier because they are not coming with being 100 kilogram overweight they're not coming with type 2 type 3 diabetes uh they you know I actually get fitter and healthier people and who are actually saying, hey, look, um, I've already done all that work. I've done, uh, my body isn't actually in a prime condition um, and I've done some healing on myself. And, and you know, there's, there is suddenly you work with a very different clientele compared with the, the train wrecks that you often enough still see. So in, in your profession, which is in, in, that vein of your life and in regards to others what kind of advice or, or 
a daily discipline or something, mm -hmm. the five minute gardener routine. Yep. What, what can you offer or what do you offer the folks that you work with that you mm -hmm. have seen mm -hmm. has made the, the biggest difference in their lives? I think the reality is that, that uh, I, I'm still exploring who I want to be when I grow up. Um, so I'm still grow growing. Up. It's a trap. <laughs> oh, touche, touche. Okay. <laughs> no, it's I'm still developing. So the man that I'm today is different from the man I was three months ago because I've, I've had new insights because I've, I went out out of my way to find those insights. I've been exposing myself to new experiences, to new skills. Um, therefore, I'm growing. So therefore, what I might tell a patient who I see in the in the setting before surgery might be different now than I did maybe in a year ago. Sure. But I will certainly give them simple advices to actually live more intentional, to actually think of what their body really needs. What are their 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 absolute needs? And one of them is sleep, which we completely neglect. Hydration. Most of us are running around dry like crisps. Nutrition, my God, 80, 90% of the stuff that we eat shouldn't even be called food. That the packaging has more nutrition than what we eat. Um, so it's those kind of things. So they are the simple, simple things. Um, uh, being more physically uh, active out there. These are sort of the four, the four key things where I would say you. these are the low-hanging fruit. Right. And by, by just simply... In the morning, having a glass of water on the bedside table. And before your feet touch the floor, you drink that glass of water. You do that in the morning, you do that in the evening. Suddenly you have drunk a liter more water than you previously had. Um, it's simple. You don't need to be a, a, a brain surgeon to be that. Um, but you very quickly will reap the rewards. Uh, your body changes. Uh, with you suddenly uh, getting the right nutraceuticals on board, with you getting the right amount of protein on board, um, suddenly you change the amount of serotonin that your body can produce and you feel happier. Well, wow, you have just changed your mood by simply um, doing what actually your body was supposed to do, Absolutely. to move to eat healthy, to look after itself. So you're doing very simple things with a huge benefit already. And then from that basis, you can then start going more up there. So I, I if I hear people who sort of on the 1st of January say, oh, from now on, I will meditate six hours a day and it's going to be amazing. And I'm going to be a new man or woman or whatever. Um, yeah, about that. Um, it is implementing consistent change and you analyze, you take action, you analyze again. And that's what you do. But you keep taking action, keep taking action until you've reached it. Thomas Alpha Edison, 2000 ways how not to create a light bulb. He was not a failure. He just tried and tried and tried until he succeeded. Persistent. And I think that is the, yeah. Um, and and it's beautiful. And I think this is the way we can train ourselves to live intentional. And then it automatically happens that we will be better leaders, better communicators. We were therefore, we therefore expose ourselves to better connections, to more meaningful connections, to more meaningful uh, and hor horizon widening yeah, and, and uh, to take insights. take individual perspective into a larger scope from exactly. An organization, a company, corporation. To share. People get more done with less supervision and will exceed expectations nearly every time. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, this is, that is, there is a lot of growth still to be done. No shit. Yeah. I mean, but uh, it is, it's communications and discussions like ours today will hopefully plant the seed um, with us being open. And maybe a little bit vulnerable um, in in us uh, saying things. I mean, we could both shut up and could say, no, no, no. They all think we are nutters. Um, so therefore, there is this risk. This fear. We have a conversation to prove it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. There you go. So there's this fear avoidance. 
Right. Or you could say, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? Okay. And actually let's talk about it. And even if someone thinks, wow, you were way out there, at least we made them think. Okay. And, and maybe they might, they might have an experience. They might have, oh God, I, I went to a chiropractor um, and um, he did the usual crunch, crunch, crunch. And then in one session, he didn't touch me. And suddenly my pelvis went woof, as if he had one of these adjustment uh, things done. My, my pelvis just went woof, and I thought, what the hell was that? And he was, he had not touched me. So he was basically healing at that moment. And later I confronted him and said, hey man, um, how much of your, of your practice is actually healing and how much is chiropractor? And he looked at me and said, uh, but 50, 50. <laughs> so here, yeah, here I was, I did not expect it, but when it happened, I recognized what was going on. Um, yes, and, arts such as that have been really looked upon harshly in history because they saw, because it is not understood. Yeah. Right. So it, it's witchcraft or it's something <laughs> or other, right? Exactly. It, it's something that's not normal. Yeah. And yeah. so it's looked upon with disdain. And that's, that's I think, wrong. and we need to be very careful there because there are some, um, some people in that discipline who, uh, in those disciplines, I call them fringe medicine, just for the sake of it and to give it actually a negative it word. Yeah. Um, they, they completely bedevil everything else. So for them, oh, no, no, I will, I will cure you. I will cure cancer with acupuncture my ass you don't um right. okay so there are people who kill people because of some very misconstrued well, the first thing I would think that would be the red flag is them making a claim uh, touche exactly but these are out there and because of those people those extremists so to speak um uh, the school medicine always has been very ooh, come on these are nutters Nowadays, as I said, it's breaking down a bit with us you gotta, you gotta actually seeing. Yeah. So there are, there is a growing, a growing movement of being open and willingness to, to work together. Um, and with us learning from each other and combining forces. And I think that is the, well, no, that is the power that we have. The skills, right? It, it's teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> Where have you heard about that? <laughs> Any more corny? <laughs> but yes, it is. It is actually true. I'm corny, but, silly. But I, one... You know, I grew up in the Midwest. There was a lot yeah. of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but said you need to be. Uh, you need to be uh, more specific. Teamwork, yes, but you need to make sh make sure that you are the dumbest member of your power team. It's no good that you think you know everything. You need to be the dumbest guy and bring people around you who are further down the path than you well, are it, in the various no, disciplines. You know, years ago, when I first started my professional corporate career, I was in the aerospace industry. I was in, responsible for $7 million a month in commercial spare shipments, over 800 part numbers. And I was always at or above goal. And you know, my supervisors came to me one day and, and asked me what the heck I was doing. And it was just in that creating a, an atmosphere where I was helpful as opposed uh, to hindering. Uh, and, good. you know, so there's that operational capacity of playing the fool and going into new areas. Because I was a new uh, guy on the block, right? I was the youngest in the department, 35 people. It was okay for me to admit that, hey, I don't know what's going on here. Help me out, please. Yeah, yeah. Ha, 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 ha. And sometimes um, if something is, uh, something looks stupid, but if it works, it's not stupid. Um, so you need to sometimes fresh set of eyes. And I think that is something. Smart, right? <laughs> touché, touché. No, I think it, we all, we all can learn so much. And I think we need to learn by stopping and feeling stopping and listening to our to our to to the energies within us to the voices within us to the feelings that we have got accepting that, that there voice are... it's telling me hey guys you've been at this too long now 
<laughs> yep, exactly. I was thinking about that too. <laughs> oh, it's such enjoyable, right? I mean, these kind of conversations, just the friends you haven't met yet, and, and um, we've all known each other before somewhere, somehow, and occasionally we come back and say, hey, how you doing? Let's catch up, right? So thank you so much, Stefan, for this wonderful conversation, the depth of your knowledge and sharing your own perspective and how you got through things as tough as they were. It is an absolute honor. Sen, thank you very much for creating such a platform um, where we can share our, our stories and therefore let others see that, you know, even two numb nuts like the two of us uh, can turn their lives around, can transform and can make the best out of whatever the situation is. So therefore, if we can do that, there is hope for others. And I think that was, that's beautiful. So thank you very much for creating this platform. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Oh, thank you. And uh, you're welcome. <laughs> and namaste and in la catch. Thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefil, your host, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>